Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Droll Zur. He is the chief executive of Office of Her of uh, Magentic Eye. Droll, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for having me today. So if you would, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, how you arrived at this point. Uh, we'll get into some of the details of uh, Magentic, but uh, before we do... Um, what's your story to this point in your career? Yeah, thank you so much. So I have um, I have something. I have a PhD in the applied mathematics and computer science, and before I had the master of uh, science and bachelor in electrical engineering, uh, with a focus on what was called then uh, computer vision stuff like that, which is now called the artificial intelligence. And then I have 30 years of more than 30 years of experience, you know, in the industry, in technological um, um, companies, uh, uh, and about uh, 25 years of them in the medical, uh, in the medical device companies. Uh, so I, I worked with uh, you know, companies who operate like Johnson & Johnson. I worked in startup that was purchased with... Um, by uh, St. Jude Medical. So I have experience in this area. And then um, after uh, some years, in this um, almost 20 years, uh, I've uh, decided that I would like to found and to establish something by myself. It took me some time. Uh, I had my own company, which was a consulting company. I looked for something that will have, uh, you know, um, an unmet need, um, a technological challenge, and also a business case. And in, 20, 20, in 2014, I found that um, uh, reducing the miss rate in the colonoscopy test actually answers uh, to the three main criteria which I have. Fantastic. So lots of experience in sort of building uh, vision intelligence, um, you know, background in that, obviously, in healthcare and doing some of those uh, kind of activities. You ended up on colonoscopy. Um, it's everybody's favorite uh, term and activity to uh, get engaged in. Uh, we, we continue to struggle to get people to actually undergo screening that saves lives. Uh, colon cancer is still a major killer in this country and certainly around the world, um, yet we can prevent it, but we've got to find it and find it early, and colonoscopy is one of the ways of doing it. Tell us a little bit about the background to how you got here with um, Magentic and you know what the story was in, in sort of creating that. Was that existing technology? Did you create it? What, what was the, uh, um, the, the process? Okay, so at, as I said, in, 2020, in 2014, uh, it was an unmet need. Like it was known that uh, colonoscopy test is the gold standard for screening and preventing um, uh, colorectal cancer. But yet it was also known, according to studies that were uh, conducted uh, until then, that about 25% of the polyps are missed. And each miss can be critical because polyps can be dangerous or, or non-dangerous. And if it is dangerous, it can develop to colorectal cancer, which, as you observe, is uh, can be deadly. So, um, um, uh, so it was an unmet need, and there was no technological solution for that. But what happened uh, uh, at this at that time uh, was that uh, the area of AI, the area of AI began and it began to be practical, you know, for use in the industry, especially. A, a subcategory of it, which called deep learning, mm -hmm. began to be practical, and companies began to use it in the, uh, uh, you know, in the industry. And this is what I believed in: that we can take this uh, powerful uh, uh, deep learning uh, technology and apply it uh, in order to try to use uh, to try to solve uh, the uh, to reduce the miss rate of uh, polyps 
by training uh, these models of deep learning to detect polyps and to be an additional eye which helps to the doctor to, to detect more polyps. So, so I, I'm right in saying you said 2014, right? That was when, yeah. when we we started. When we started and, yeah. I, and I, I'm I'm going to say I'm casting my mind back, but I do remember the first instance of when I, what we talked about was a virtualization of the colonoscopy, and of course there was huge excitement in the population because now suddenly no more bowel prep. I mean that's the reality for most folks that the actual procedures. Uh, you know, r- relatively mundane, um, really very safe, um, but the bowel prep is quite unpleasant. Um, I, I don't think it's gotten any better, at least not in my personal experience. Um, and there was uh, the, the emergence of these faster scanners. And my recollection of this historically was the first thing we saw was a virtual colonoscopy that was done using a CT similar to the sort of CT angiograms that we see, and that was a function of uh, speed of acquisition and movement and so forth. Was that the sort of genesis of this, or was there something that I'm missing? Yes. So uh, so I think, um, um, you know, it was really something new and something something very promising, and it still it, still it is, and it, it has, and it still will have, you know, its market share. I mean, no, no, no doubt about it. And it had its own advantages, as you mentioned. I mean, no need for a, a bowel preparation or anesthesis. You know, uh, this, uh, so this, this is uh, 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 something uh, definitely an advantage. Yet, I think uh, the most accurate, I think there's no doubt about it, that the most accurate test for, uh, once again, for colorectal cancer, a screening and prevention is the colonoscopy test because you have the camera in the colon close, you know, to the tissue and you get the best, uh, the, the highest resolution and the uh, highest quality uh, image which the doctor can um, uh, can test. And more than that, uh, if needed, if something is detected, then immediately it can be treated. Right. In contrast to the this field jaw test, that if something is suspicious, then you can more talk and if then we are more talk about suspicion, then uh, the patient has to be referred to the colonoscopy test. Yeah, I mean, when, when, when we talk about screening, obviously we're talking sensitivity, specificity, and, you know, the challenge between those two and the impossibility of, of getting 100% of either. I mean, you, you can get it, but then you, you essentially upset the other side of that particular coin. So, uh, you know, finding the right test and, you know, historically, the, the major test was obviously the fecal occult blood. So looking for blood in the stool, very insensitive, had all sorts of, you know, potential error rates. I know that they sort of work to find um, better markers or better indicators of that. But really, it was a very sort of generic, um, unsatisfying I think the colonoscopy has proven to be, you know, it, it still is the gold standard. We've seen some additional testing. Um, you know, I think the biomarkers um, that are now being used, uh, Cologuard, I think, is the brand name for uh, screening, but still has the problems that you describe, which is we, we don't get to actual treatment, and all we get is a suspicion, and if you get suspicion, then you're down into a path. Do you think there's some um, utility to doing this in a... Uh, a staged approach so that we start with, you know, depending on where we are and the risk levels, um, you know, moving down the pathway to more and more intervention. Because obviously, in your particular instance, um, and we should get to that in a second, it's a less invasive uh, activity. um, But, you know, you you can't treat it if you find it. I, I, is is there some scope to sort of defining this sequence of appropriateness and you know how we do this? I mean, have you thought through this at all? Well, I think uh, first of all, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think and, and, and I think what you have mentioned in the beginning is exactly the point. I mean, first of all, it's a matter of sensitivity and specificity of the performance uh, of the test, and and this uh, this new uh, stool test. With biomarkers are really sounds uh, that they have promising potential, and I think if they would be proven, really, you know, to, to have a high 
uh, I, uh, performance, regard uh, sensitivity and specificity, then I think it can be thought to have a gradual test. But as you mentioned, it will be something in to, to do it in steps, but you have to, uh, colonoscopy test still definitely will stay, you know, the, the main uh, test or the, the test that, you know, that everything is uh, uh, directed to, you know, because you then you have at the end the test, which is in which you see you know, actually what is going on. Mm -hmm. The thing is can be treated. There are countries, you know, out of the U.S. By the way, which has a, a bowel, uh, well, they have um, bowel screening programs and stuff mm -hmm. like, that, which really said you know today that it, they're using uh, um, they're using stool test like you know a, a hidden blood uh, test and. Uh, only if it is positive, it is recommended um, uh, to go to colonoscopy. So in some places, it is already in this way. Mm -hmm. But yet, for example, in the UK, I, know, I think it is like that. But yet there are a lot of colonoscopy tests in the UK. Interesting. So um, tell us a little bit about Magentic Eye and what it is that you do. Um, you know, what's the process? Uh, what's What's been the sort of pathway to get to this point? Um, you've obviously some recent news with the FDA, which is obviously exciting, but tell us a little bit about the background, if you would. Yeah, so so actually what, uh, maybe I will uh, I will tell a few things about the technology itself. So um, uh, the Magentic Eye product is the Magentic Holo. It is an add-on. It's adjunct to the, to the colonoscopy device. It is, uh, and it uh, gets uh, the video uh, output of the colonoscopy device, this video which goes directly to the monitor at which the physician will look. And uh, instead of uh, going directly to the monitor, it goes through the computer a unit of uh, the Magenti Colo. This mm. unit breaks it into frames. And with its AI engine, it, uh, it uh, tries to detect polyp. And if a polyp is detected, it signs it with a bounded box as an overlay. Hmm. And then the video with the overlay is sent to the monitor. So in the monitor, so there is a monitor also with the um, video and uh, and this bounded box, which draw the attention of the physician directly to the, to the, to the polyp in a way that uh, she or he cannot uh, miss it. Uh, and this is the way it actually improves. Uh, you know, the average adenomas. Adenoma is the dangerous type of polyp. The, the average number of adenomas which are uh, detected per test and also the percentage of patients with at least one adenoma uh, which are detected. And we did a huge, uh, a big clinical trial, you know, international, which was run in the US, in Europe, and in Israel. Uh, the company headquarters is in Israel. And, and it really clinically proved uh, the efficiency I mean, of using the um, using the Magenti Colo in order to increase, let's say, the, the average and, um, and number of adenomas per test which are detected, and to reduce the miss rate, and to reduce uh, the miss rate. And this was also one of the basis for the FDA. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today I'm talking to Droll Zur. He is the CEO of Magentic Eye. We were just getting into the details of the technology. So um, essentially this is an add-on to the colonoscopy process, the gold standard of uh, diagnosis. It takes the images that we get from the colonoscopy as it's being performed and essentially puts in additional information for uh, the uh, practicing physician who's carrying out the procedure, who would do this unaided, typically. Um, you know, he does it visually, he looks through, this is all based on experience, you know, the identification of these lesions, obviously the identification of polyps and adenomas in particular, um, critical to the success. And, you know, even with the colonoscopy, there is um, a, a small risk that somebody might miss something. And what we're essentially doing here is using technology to surveil that imagery. And then I, I assume some level of the deep learning that we talked about earlier is being applied to say that you've trained this through, um, you know, large amounts of data uh, to then say, well, I'm seeing something, even if you don't, 
um, and drawing the attention of the surge, the, uh, the the surgeon to it. Tell us a little bit about the the process and the data that you've sort of accrued, and you know what you're getting in terms of results, because it sounds like you've got some progress here, right? Of course, yes. So as you have said, we are talking about millions of frames video with um, you know from taking from recorded colonoscopy tests, which we use. Um, which we use in order to train the system. All the data, by the way, was uh, collected under clinical uh, studies for data collection uh, uh, with, of course, uh, IRB approval, uh, patient consent, and stuff like that. But we're doing it since uh, almost the beginning of the company, you know, collecting this data, and we continue to collect. And this is essential for this type of uh, uh, this type of technology. Mm. You know, because what is we have um, a team we call it the clinical team, you know, and they are well, all the way, all the, and they have a medical background, and all what they are doing is taking these videos, checking, uh, you know, uh, using uh, the help of a senior gastroenterologist and reports from the procedure, and they are really verifying where the polyps appears in these videos, and they tag it, you know, and this is what we call the grand truth. For this type of technology, and then, as you have said, the the model, the AI model, is trained on millions of frames. For which frame there is an answer, which is the grand truth. If there is a polyp and where the polyp is, and accordingly, the really system learns, you know, where it is, and then when it encounter in real time, like in the field, when it encounter a new frame of a new video, and if there is a polyp, it knows to say that here there is a polyp. Uh, based on what it learned. I mean, so this is like we train the brain of the model to be ready for new things that will appear. So, uh, you know, millions of images, lots of training going through this. Uh, what are the results like? I, I know you mentioned them, but it, uh, just tell us what you've managed to achieve. And I, I, again, I think there's also this FDA clearance, which means that this is now potentially available um, here in the U.S., yeah, so maybe the clinical validation, I think maybe it is uh, the most mm -hmm. important. So we have seen an uh, increase in the APC, which is adenoma per colonoscopy, like the average number of adenoma, the dangerous body per colonoscopy. We have seen when using the system an increase of about, a relative increase, of about 37% uh, in, the adenoma, in, the, in the adenoma per colonoscopy. And then in the ADR, which is adenoma detection rate, which is the percentage of patients um, in which, in whom at least one, at least one of the noma was detected, uh, a percentage among of all the patients that were tested, an increase when using the system of 26%. And then the miss rate, because in our clinical study, part of the patients went through double colonoscopy, first one and immediately a second one. And what is found, what was found in the second one is actually a miss of the first one, so we could measure miss something which is called the miss rate, mm -hmm. and miss rate was cut almost by half, which is uh, I think uh, and all these results were significant, uh, statistically significant. And this uh, what uh, actually proved the efficacy uh, of uh, using the system, and it was done over like nine nine hundred fifty two patients were recruited in ten centers and thirty. One colonoscopist will participate. Yeah, I, I, I mean, let, let's dive into that a little bit because obviously, you know, people are listening to this across a spectrum. And, you know, certainly for those folks that are listening to it and saying, well, you know, what about me? What about my colonoscopy? You know, that miss rate even today is relatively low. But obviously, for the one patient that happens, that happens to, that's a huge deal because if you miss it, you don't get screened again, you know, potentially have a diagnosis that's missed and then develop a, a later stage or you're discovered at a later stage. That's a, a huge negative. And what you're saying, I, what, what I heard was um, the uh, miss rate decrease. And I think I heard you say it was more than 50, over half. As almost half. Almost, almost half. Bit so, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. you know, as close as anything based on, <laughs> you know, that's a big deal. So the reduction, you know, that alone, and then obviously the opportunity to identify things, um, you know, through that process, obviously, you know, that's exciting. So um, you must be pleased. I mean, this is good news. Uh, I think, you know, there's real potential. What's the sort of 
current use use of this? Is this in play? What, where are we seeing this? So we are now getting prepared to deploy our system send medical centers in the U.S. Uh, it will begin relatively soon, like uh, later on uh, this year. Uh, and we hope to reach more and more centers in the U.S., really in order to, um, um, you know, to help saving more lives uh, of, uh, uh, of people in the U.S. Uh, I think we can really, according to these results, you know, we can really have that. And at the end of the day, I think I can recommend, you know, uh, that we will try to be present at as many as possible centers. And I really recommend, you know, to everyone to think about asking to have a, a colonoscopy with AI. Mm. Because even if you have a great doctor, you know, it just can help. You know, maybe it will, you know, it, it just right. can an additional eye that can help. Yeah, I mean, I, and one of the challenges, obviously, in the U.S. is uh, who pays for it. And, uh, you know, we continue to sort of struggle with this. Um, you, you know, one of the key things will be the validation of this from a billing perspective, uh, you, you know, yeah. uh, to sort of include it. Um, you know, there's also, I would imagine, I mean, these things are all recorded. So surely there's some potential to actually do this retroactively and say, hey, we could take all of these recordings, even though it's been carried out. If you, you know, we, we've seen this with um, radiology departments where they'll run, you know, some uh, background detection to say, hey, what did we miss in that process? Thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I think it's a great, it's, it's a great uh, point that you are touching and we had the thought about that. And actually, from our point of view, like as a company, technological, you know, that we are ready for that because we are running all this training that we have mentioned from the cloud. You know, we are running many things from the cloud and in order to, and we are actually ready, almost ready, you know, like it could be something almost immediate, and, you know, to give this service also in offline from the cloud. You know, mm. I think that either, let's say the medical center, you know, or even if we are looking a little bit in, a, you know, in the, some vision a little bit uh, ahead more to the future, you know, that the patient can uh, can get a recording and upload it to the cloud and get an additional uh, an additional results, you know, from the AI that will uh, that will uh, that will test uh, uh, this video and give the and give the the report. Uh, but I think really this is a matter of really of to see how it will. Uh, how it will work with the regulations and with the reimbursement method and stuff like that. But in my opinion, this is something that will happen. It's just a matter of time, you know, not the far, not the very far future. So, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I, certainly folks that listen to me know that I've spent, you know, my career, m my life pretty much collecting my medical record. I insist on getting information. It historically was extraordinarily difficult you know, images, I still have old films, I've digitized them, although, you know, yeah. questionable the value of all of that. Now I sort of, you know, anytime I have imaging done, I'm insisting on getting my DICOM images. And now you've raised an issue and I'm thinking for the colonoscopies that I've had, and I've had certainly more than one, um, I, I'm thinking back and going, gosh, I didn't even think to ask for the video. I'm sure that that's going to create no end of, you know, resistance initially. Why do you want it? Whatever. But now I actually want it because at least if I have it, I can retrospectively go back and look to say, or even, you know, potentially upload it and say, here, m you know, here's an opportunity. So um, I, I think it raises a number of uh, opportunities for folks to sort of think about, and obviously for you. Um, tell us what you're excited about uh, for the future. Yeah, okay. So for the future, we have um, um, we have uh, several things that are, I would say, in our pipeline. Uh, and we um, and I would include first the, the, the next version, which is already being uh, being um, uh, tested uh, in the field. For example, in Israel, in Europe, is um, a version which includes also uh, polyp characterization and size estimation characterization, with whether it is dangerous or not, and the size estimation, which is also important because mm. it's about the maturity of the polyp. The more mature it is, the more if it is dangerous, the more right. closer it uh, to potential uh, uh, unfortunate cancer and uh, and then we work with additional things like uh, 
uh, cleansing level, automatic calculation of the cleansing level of the fashion, mm. which is very important because the fashion should come prepared. You know, the, the more prepared, the better. And there is a standard about that. About, and we want to be more standardized. In addition to features, we collect data also for upper GI issues, uh, you know, to, to treat, and also for specific diseases, not only a polyp, to help with AI to, di to diagnose additional, uh, additional things. Uh, yeah, so we see, I would say, that really in the future we hope, we think we can uh, give some kind of a GI uh, suite, AI sorry, AI suite for the gastroenterologist. Fantastic. So uh, the future is bright. I think uh, another example of uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, you know, just generically those terms being applied in healthcare in a way that's meaningful, delivering positive change. Unfortunately, as we do each and every week, we've run out of time. So it just remains for me to uh, thank you uh, for joining me on the show. Draw, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much, Nick, Nick, for letting me have this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. 